And so come Christmas, uh, the landmark that is, has been known as the Staples Center will be known formally as Crypto.com Arena. But uh, I'm sure our guest, Sports Illustrated senior writer Chris Herring, agrees that that's not going to stick. We're we going to call it the Staples Center. And everybody gonna know what we're talking about. If you say crypto.com arena, people will be like, what? Where? You, I mean, you know what's so funny about it though, Michael, is that when I see that, it, it, it probably does exactly the job. On the one hand, I'm thinking, what company, what business signs up to just get skewered for days on end? But then it's, it's kind of <laughs> like the troll on Twitter that tweets something and what they want is a reaction because we're talking about right. The name you gotta go look at their bio. Been. Yeah. So, you yeah, gotta go look at their exactly. bio. Like, wait, wait, who is this person? What if they tweeted? So, wait, who am I talking to? <laughs> not a like damn that. person is ever gonna call it that, other than the announcers that have to do it officially for the, these games that are on television, but doesn't matter because we're talking about it and we weren't talking about it yesterday. So it's it's actually brilliant in a lot of ways, but uh who knows whether cryptocurrency will even be around. I guess we'll we'll see in a few years here. Hey, I listen, I needed to be around as much money as I got in Bitcoin. Michael, Michael <laughs> know that I'm all up on Bitcoin. That's right. <laughs> so. Hey, how, how about the uh, how about the teams that play in, in crypto.com arena right now? How, what's your feeling on the Clippers and specifically the Lakers? Because I know a lot of people expected them to have uh, to be at a playing at a championship level right now. Well, I'll start with the, the Clippers first because they've been relatively hot. I know they ran into the, the buzzsaw that's been the, the Bulls lately, which obviously they, they run into the buzzsaw that was the Warriors. Um, the Clippers, they, they're one of the most interesting teams in the league, I think, just because they have a style of play. Even when they struggled and started one and three or one and four, whatever it was, they had a style of play that seemed like it should work. We saw it in the playoffs, even without Kawhi Leonard. Um, they, they can go small. They've got Zubac. They got a, a legitimate star who, you know, maybe he's not enough to win you a title, but can, you know, obviously from what we saw last year, can get you in the conversation for that, even without his co-star. So we've seen that work. We know that they've got a good defense. They just spread the ball around. And there was one possession they had where they just literally just kind of passed it around the circle. And it, it's impossible to guard a defense or an offense like that, where they've got so many guys that can stretch the floor they can switch styles on you to play big, to play smaller. Um, Reggie Jackson's taken 16 three-pointers in games because he's getting so many open looks. It's a hard team to defend. And um, so it, this is more like what I expected to see them as. It's hard to imagine them winning a title, but we don't know if and when Kawhi comes back. And so they're intriguing. They're going to be intriguing all season long, I think, with this roster. And particularly if Kawhi comes back, they can do even more. Now, if we go to the Lakers... <laughs> Um, they, they're, they're not fully formed. It, it's really easy to kind of get the jokes in on them. I've been guilty of it. Some of them are not jokes. Some of it is legitimately concerning. I think <laughs> some of them uh, are jokes. <laughs> <laughs> some of them are jokes and we're yeah. going to get these jokes off, but West, some West of them Brooke are not. Is who he is. <laughs> yes. And I mean, that, that is the game that he has 35 and 10 and shoots well because he's kind of playing the sort of style that you want to see Russell Westbrook play downhill in transition that pull up jumper from 17 that is pretty good for him has always been pretty good for him and then there's the rust that decides he's going to take like eight or nine threes and the one that is going to have you within two points at the end of the game and then commit a really crazy turnover where he takes a one on three and you're like what are you doing and and, and the rust that i think the bigger question because they will be fully formed at some point they'll have none they just got taylor horton tucker back um the bigger question and, and the one that I've had from the beginning from when they made this trade and I imagine this trade seems to get more and more painful for fans it looks so for, bad. that haven't it kind of come so to bad. grips with it. it, it yeah. The idea that Russ is the guy that they have when maybe it could have been healed. It could have been DeRozan. It could have been any number of guys. It could have been the guys that they had and just kind of go one more year with them. And the, you know, the bench that was basically their third best player after LeBron and AD to begin with. And the idea that for every badly missed jump shot that Russ takes, or for every pick and roll that you run with Anthony Davis, where it's defended by three people instead of two, because the third person decides that they can play off of Russ and, and kind of sink into the paint to stop LeBron from getting to the basket and from AD getting a wide open jumper. 
that's the challenge. And I think, you know, some of that stuff will become clearer when the games mean more, but we've already seen instances where it just looks off and um, you know, it, they're going to win a lot of games. They're going to lose. I think a lot as well. Some of them are going to be of the more embarrassing nature, but I just don't feel great about it, but they, there is more to look forward to if you're a Laker fan, as far as the team being more fully formed and the rotation gelling, you would hope a little bit more, but it's an old team. We know Carmelo, God bless him. I covered him for several years. It's amazing. He still has this much left in the tank, but he's not going to shoot. I mean, he's not going to be a borderline all-star as far as his efficiency yeah. the whole year, I don't think either. And so some of these things are going to regress. Um, you would hope some things progress, but I, I don't know what the ceiling really is for this team with, with Russ there. I'm, I'm not sure what it is legitimately. Yeah, no, I know. I, I don't feel about feel great about um, my preseason finals prediction of Lakers Nets at this point, but specifically with the Lakers, man, like I, I like that approach. I just want off this roller coaster. Because it feels like every time we talk about them, we talk about them from the context Hold of like, on. oh, wait, they're kind of figuring it out. And then it's like Anthony <laughs> Davis said, oh, we suck. You know, it's like, okay, wait a second. Like, they're not, they're not even, they're the Lakers in name only right now. Because just to recap, they just got THT back. Ariza hasn't played yet. LeBron might be back Friday. Um, and Austin Reeves sometime after Thanksgiving. So, and, and not to mention Kendrick Nunn, who, who might be more critical than we realize going into the season. So it's almost like, it's hard to do that with the Lakers pump the brakes, but you kind of have to because and you put it perfectly. They haven't been fully formed. So with that having said that Chris, I really want to focus more on the Clippers though, man, because with the Clippers, we only talk about them for purposes of clowning them and Michael will tell you if I'm lying, I'm flying. Been wanting to talk about Paul George in particular for several days now, but never got around to it. Now's the perfect time to do it. Career highs in several categories. I know he's got a career high usage rate. Uh, asked to be more facilitator than he's been uh, really in his, high, his, his entire career. I think it's a career high usage rate putting up all NBA if not MVP caliber numbers carrying this team. Okay, I wonder with Paul George, especially like last year, he kind of redeemed himself in the playoffs kind of as best the Clipper could without going all the way. <laughs> he kind of redeemed himself <laughs> for his bubble performance, which injury mental, yeah. whatever you want to call it. He struggled in the bubble kind of redeemed himself in the postseason. Are we collectively guilty of defining Paul George prematurely as in is Paul George not done figuring out who he is as it relates to an alpha for lack of a better phrase. That's it's that's a fascinating question. I think there was always this urge, I think even from when he was with Indiana to kind of crown him that way because he was the best player on that team. He was, a, 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 if not dominant, he was a great two-way player on that team. Uh, you know, a bunch of guys that were good, but not great, not guys that would build your whole team around with Hibbert and David West. And so you had that aspect of him. Then he went to go join a team in Oklahoma City where they already had Russ. Um, so he's always been in situations aside from the Indiana one where there's always another guy. And so you've never, aside from Indiana, you've never really had a full chance to see him. Like, what can he do in a situation where he has to do it on his own? And that's been the cool thing about the Clippers situation is that it's weird. You would think having the superstar that he's playing next to makes it way easier. And I think Kawhi Leonard does. But also, Paul George has these stretches seemingly every year, even back in Oklahoma City, where he goes off and he looks like a top, not a top 15, not a top 10 guy, like a top five guy. And I would say he has a few weeks every season where he looks like that. He looked like that in the playoffs, quite frankly, towards the end when Kawhi was not there. Um, and he did kind of redeem himself. It, it wasn't in a way that resulted in a championship. I don't know that it could with him as the lead guy without Kawhi there also. Um, but you, you certainly take it. And I mean, there are stretches where you feel like every shot he takes is going to go in. He can facilitate. We know that he's really, really tough defensively. Um, and it, it, it's fun to watch him play. It's not often that you see him have to put his foot on the pedal like that. But when he does it, um, he's he, he has stretches where he's as good as they come. And that that is critical for a team right now that does not have Kawhi, but also just kind of spread stuff around evenly. Teams like that oftentimes don't have a guy that really wants to step up and take that last shot. Paul George is not seemingly afraid of that, at least not right now. And it, I mean, he's in a really nice yeah. rhythm. Speaking of really nice rhythms, uh, we tried uh, the last segment. It, it gets harder with each 
incredible performance, uh, which seems to happen daily, but you're really good with words. Um, yeah. Steph Curry, who was on pace, I believe, for 443 three pointers when his own record is 402, I want to say. Wow. Uh, here's, here's, a, here's a reporter pet peeve. I'll do it. I'll do I'll do to you what we do to uh, people that we interview. Talk about Steph Curry. <laughs> <laughs> I, talk I've about, never been talk asked about anything like that. That's funny. I don't think I've ever had a question put to me like that, but I will. Yeah. Uh, where do you start? You're saying I'm good with words, but kind of guy that leaves you without words sometimes because it's just it's just easier to watch what he's doing and just say wow, or just kind of have like a facial expression. Um, it's crazy. I mean, if you've looked at Kevin Durant's numbers this year. 60% shooting, you know, just a menace from everywhere. You can't stop him. You can defend him really well. Can't stop him. For Steph to look that much better than KD does in, on a night where KD's playing at home, on a night where the fans are essentially did you hear that? Cheering for Steph. I mean, did it, you hear that? I, I get I mean, that. I wonder Brooklyn. how many fans was this. that? <laughs> was that a lot of fans? Now, we're going to talk like, about wait, how. Why am I here? We're going to talk about how the Clippers get joked on and how they're only talked about one way that, you know, the Nets are going to take that L for last night um, in terms of how that yeah. sounded on national TV. But, I mean, it, it was kind of deserved as far as just how great Steph was last night. And, you know, I have to take a little bit of an L this year. I've been right on so much as far as the offseason stuff that I predicted. I, I thought that the, the Hawks would really struggle uh, when everybody kind of thought that they'd be one of the best teams in the league this year. I thought the Bulls would be really good this year. I thought their defense would actually be good this year when a lot of people thought they'd be off. The one thing that I've been quite wrong about so far, I said, you know, it's not really worth worrying too much about the Warriors right out of the gate because we don't know when they're going to get Clay back. You can't really evaluate this team until Clay is back. Uh, I know that the Warriors have not had the strongest schedule, but even when they're playing teams like the Bulls and the Nets that have been pretty record, pretty impressive record-wise, they're just wrecking these teams. And, I mean, they, they look a little bit like those vintage nets from 2014 to 20, what was it? 2018, um, 2019. They, they look a lot like those teams in terms of the third quarter spurts, the defense being elite again. I felt like that was what they lost most over the last couple of years. It wasn't so much just, you know, the fact that the offense was different without KD. They used to be dominant defensively along with the fact that they could stretch the floor, however they wanted to along with all the ball movement and that defense is back. That's the scariest thing to me is that all of a sudden you've activated somebody like Wiggins. You activated somebody like Jordan Poole who looked real, real rough. I know guys progressed in their first couple of years. Jordan Poole looked real rough, was making the G League stops, you know, left and right. Uh, Wiggins looks like a, a, a menace, just dunking on, on Towns and everybody else. You've got Gary Payton's son in there, you know, dunking on people at 6'3". It's, I mean, it's an interesting, interesting team. Iguodala looks rejuvenated being back there. Um, it's scary, and uh, you know I, I, it's hard to not see how they're the favorite right now, and that's without play, and that's without knowing what they're going to do with these rookies that they could redeem for another good star player or somewhere else potentially. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know what it looks like when they put it all together. I imagine that actually is one of the the cruxes for them is like, you know, what do they do if Steph comes along? I'm sorry, if Clay comes along somewhat slowly. Um, what do you do in terms of kind of threading this needle as far as the youngsters? But worry about that when it gets here. I mean, I didn't think that they would be at this stage without play there. It's, it's pretty impressive to see it, but they look like they're in their bag. I mean, they are in their bag. It's not that it looks that way. Chris, this is a, the, the final question uh, we have for you today. I know the cliche about New York is that 8 million stories in the city. I'm not going to ask you about 8 million stories. Uh, I'm going to ask about two sentences. Give me two sentences on three stories, and you take the first one, the one that moves you the most. Uh, there's a story in New York about the Nets not being as championship ready as we thought. A story in New York about the Knicks, the current Knicks. And there's a story in New York that's coming out uh, with a uh, byline, with an author line, your author line, your book. So tell me, give me a couple of lines on the story that moves you the most, uh, like uh, in each story, a couple lines on each story. Okay, I got you. Um... The Nets, I think, I think we're overreacting a little bit. I mean, again, the, the Bulls you. look fantastic so far. The, the Nets haven't been I don't want you to I say mean, that. Oh, man. <laughs> the, the Nets, Nets. I, I'm, I'm swiping. Not, swipe, I'm not going to say they're fine. I'm not going to say they're fine, but they, I mean, they, they, record-wise, they've done better. They had all this crazy stuff swirling around them right before the season started. It's KD and, and Harden trying to figure out how to do it 
and Joe Harris is out, all sorts of stuff. So, I mean, the Warriors are making everyone look silly. So I'm not worried about that. Their wins have been really struggle wins over a lot of really bad teams. So I'm more concerned about that is, are they kind of just collecting wins against bottom feeders? What do they look like against the good teams, which they've been losing those games consistently so far. So that's my concern, but it's so early. I mean, I'm not even concerned about the Bucks right now. Um, they've got a losing record because they haven't had their whole team there. So at some point, maybe a decision has to be made. Maybe Kyrie has to step up and say, okay, I don't want them to go out like this. And does that force his hand a little bit? Should it force his hand? Whatever. So there's that. I, I'm not worried about them yet, but I, I will be if we look up in a month or two, maybe. The Knicks, they are a completely new look team. And I think we've learned so far that new look, even if it means really great things for the offense, which is one of the best in the league so far, it's meant really, really weird things for their defense, which was kind of their calling card last year as a calling card of every Tom Thibodeau coach team. Um, you know, basically the best offense in the league, but the worst defensive rating for their starting five, basically in league history is what we've been looking at, which is kind of the cost of adding Kemba Walker and Evan Fournier to that starting lineup. Everybody else was coming back from last year. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things where there's this really nasty smell in the room and you kind of have a sense who did it, but you don't want to be rude about it. Thibodeau hasn't completely said that, but it's very clear that Kemba and Evan Fournier don't really work together defensively, which a lot of Boston fans are probably saying, like, we could have told you that. Um, so that that's the challenge. And they're benched consistently every single game now for like the last five, six games. They get out to a pretty bad start. They're down by 10 or 15 points. Their bench brings them back. Their bench has the best rating net rating in the league of all lineups and they bring them back from 10 or 15 down they take a lead and then the starters come back in and lose the game in the fourth or like what happened in the last game tom Thibodeau says okay enough i'm not going to let our starters lose this for us he brings the bench back in and mm -hmm. they they come back and they come back from behind and win and so that's going to be the question is it what how long does tom Thibodeau let this go and he suggested he's not going to let it go very long so at some point does kemba come off the bench does fournier come off the bench to balance that lineup a little bit more between offense defense. I'm not completely concerned about it yet, but you can see very clearly that's their problem. The third one, I'm not even sure what you want me to say about your book. This is basically the talk about question that Michael just asked a minute ago. Um, <laughs> your book, your book. It's my, it's my book. So when, I guess, um, when is it out? It comes it, out. When? It comes out January, January 18th. Right? Uh, so I think we're about two months out now from, from when it officially comes out. Uh, the pre-orders, link is there is available i would urge anybody to go get it but it, it's fun they're let, they're letting me loosen up just a little bit we're gonna have a book trailer that i swear to you like i don't care about the knicks as far as being a fan or anything like that it gets my blood pumping and it is, it is like one of the most adrenaline fueled things i've ever seen in my life um and we will have that coming out next week before black I'm friday um hey oh fantastic hey, I, I, wait look and i, 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 just, I just love Mike. yeah yeah I'll just tell you the industry. I get you know. I got some sources now. I got sources, Chris. You got so we all got sources. The industry is excited about this. I've heard there's a starred review uh, from Publishers Weekly. So congratulations, brother. I, I cannot I wait love, to read. I it. love stories about teams that didn't win. Almost probably more than, than teams that did. Like it's just there's yes. such a love affair with this with this group, man. So congratulations, Chris. Thanks for falling through, brother. We appreciate you. Come back again soon, all right? Thank you guys so much, always. I really appreciate you both. You take care. Hey, thanks for watching, brother, from another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time on Peacock. Appreciate you.